Alrighty, but welcome back to another episode. Need to start off by venting about my session on the range, not the shooting range, the archery range, but on the golf range. Man, ah, just absolute disgust for the game and my skills. More importantly, my skills. But you know the weird thing, I was, you know, anyway. Um, besides the fact that you know I'm learning and trying to rebuild my swing, and I'm not able to see the ball. Fuck all the excuses. But it just what a awful kind of feeling when it just you kind of just realize there's so many moving parts in your body and you have no control over it and the more you're trying to control it control parts of the body then the more they sort of start resisting and then you kind of sort of let go and then they're all over the place and then someone tells you how to move your body and then there are sort of these biomechanic machines which kind of analyze how you should stand and how you should bend and how you should basically tuck your butt cheeks in and and the next thing, the entire thing just falls apart. It's almost like you hit this peak and next thing the body is just like, ah, no. And that's happened today. So I'm just extremely pissed off with my game. Uh, I'm not even playing the course. This is like, and you take it on the grass and you're just, just gouging out. <sighs> anyway, less said the better. Or maybe more said the better. Because I don't know. I was, I was Yesterday I hit a few balls. I hit 150 balls, 100 balls, whatever. And I don't know where it was going, but it felt good. Like you just nice nice sound and that's what i care about but today i had gone for a lesson and um it's this what's the weird thing about this and I'm, the reason i'm talking about this maybe you're not a person who plays golf uh, but it's it's something that um reflects on life as well i'm not trying to sound profound but really it does because you know you think you're making progress you are happy with progress and you kind of just want to be stuck there and you don't want to learn more which might threaten where you're at in your stage of progress. But I went today because I thought I could have stopped and said, you know what, this is where I want to be and I'm just hitting the ball. It sounds great, but I pushed myself to go for a lesson and it all fell apart. So like, should I have even gone? But I think this is important because you kind of are thrown into this place where nothing that you thought was working or rather everything that you thought was working isn't working and nothing that you um, sort of, in the sense, you kind of look at this uh, where you are in your stage uh, of, you know, whether developing a swing or a, uh, an act to play a game or whatever, a skill rather. I think holding on tightly, saying, oh, this is enough, is, isn't is a thing, right? Because, um, and I think at the same point, I've thought like, oh, do I need more of this? Because it's outside inputs and do I just trust my um my body to figure it out in my kind of mind but the problem with that is especially with something like golf is that you think that you are hitting or swinging the club in a certain way you have this internal image or this internal feel or this internal kind of clock or this gauge whatever you want to call it but it need not necessarily be um accurate in the, the sort of reality of execution or the kind of the way it actually delivers uh to the ball and that's where I think maybe the parallel is like you think certain things that you do are in a certain way and as a result, right. But in reality, it might not um, appear in the same way that you think it appears. Your reality, maybe um, the reality of what you're doing is different from what you perceive it to be. Eh? Profound. Man, this guy's a genius. He brings golf analogies into real life and it makes a lot of sense. God damn, son of a bitch. I like this guy. But yeah, I hate the game right now, but it's kind of making me go back to basics. So I'm going to take a couple of days and just kind of do this. There are three, four elements my hips, my shoulders, keep my head steady, keep things. But I don't know. I'm just trying to. Sorry if it's getting too golfy for you, but it's just like so many moving parts, right? It's just like. What is wrong exactly? But I don't think anything's wrong. I think it was just too much. And I kind of just, uh, everything sort of fell apart. Like all the things that supposed to, are supposed to come together. And th is it supposed to be simple? I don't think so. Because the problem, if you're lazy about it, then you just kind of just say, ah, it's okay. You know, keep it loose. Keep. And then this way YouTube sort of creeps in, right? The YouTube uh, tutorials or the videos telling, you know, don't worry about it. Don't keep this. So I think reminder that just, You've taken this decision to go to a certain person to help you. Just stick to it. Don't sort of just go back, um, take a step back and say, no, 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 no. You know, I, I, that was a mistake because YouTube, because I don't know. I think the problem with having so much information available is you're tempted, right? Because when something that the person you've 
gone to for a lesson, whether it's a coach or a guitar teacher or whatever it may be, gives you some th feedback that you don't like. So earlier you would just sort of suck it up or you would say, fuck this guy, right? And you maybe would give up the instrument or the sport or whatever you're learning. But now you have this YouTube universe, which kind of plants the seed of doubt in your head saying, nah, your, your coach may not be the best, but we have the option that might work for you. So we're going to give you tips on how to improve your thing. And there's a remarkable amount of information. And of course, there's no one way of doing anything, whether it's a golf swing or the guitar or piano or driving or whatever thing you're looking online for or look, looking to learn or a skill you're looking to acquire. But I think there's a lot of possibilities to see doubt online. Uh, and I think that's with information, that's with the news, that's with um, even learning, clearly. So, fucking YouTube. It's entertaining, but it's also a little, um, takes you off the path. And I think just maybe stick to it because you've signed up for this. And I think there will be, um, you know, one step forward, maybe a step back, maybe two steps forward, one step back. Maybe that's how progress is because you're kind of training your body to function uh, and move in a certain way. And there will be hiccups. And I think there will be days when, um, one part might not sync with the other part. So your hips may be tight, your knees might be, you know, whatever, sore or your, um, I don't know, even your balance may be off. So you kind of, I mean, just look at it like that. Like maybe even with uh, anything you sort of apply uh, that principle to, you just sometimes just don't fire on all cylinders or you might just not have the energy or you just might not have the inclination. Or, and some days you have it all, but you might just not have the, you know, opportunity to play the game. So you're just like, damn it, everything feels right, but why can't I go? So that's where I am today. So I just thought I'll talk about that because I think it's it's a good exercise in building patience because, yeah, fuck it, what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing's going to happen at all. It's just a game of golf. And I think if I can treat that, not take that approach with everything, yeah, you know, it's today and nothing. There's nothing at stake. I'm just going to go to the range and come back. There's no game. There's no tournament. There's nothing competitive in nature happening. Um, but I think it's a nice way to apply this to all aspects and say, you know what? What's the worst thing that can happen? Of course, um, depending on the situation, of course, if it's life or death, then I, I, I don't know. I haven't been in that. But even if you take this, whenever I do compete or if I'm competing and I'm like at the same stage, I'm like, yeah, fuck it. You have a bad round. I think it just helps um make sense of life because nothing is that important i think if you're if you're dead then that's it that's the final thing but everything else you can just kind of kind of just keep doing so i think it's fun to let go and fuck up once in a while and realize that you know what you have the ability to actually ability, ability yeah speaking clearly also isn't a good activity for today but you have the ability to kind of recover recuperate learn relearn or pick it up from where you left off or maybe the reason why you've sort of fell apart in the first place is because maybe there was something fundamentally wrong. So go back, do it again. And I think that's, of course, perseverance and commitment because if it happens and you keep failing, then clearly if you don't have a knack for it, then it's a little hard to keep going back. But I think there is, um, I think there is a payoff. I hope there's a fucking payoff because it can't go on like this forever. Right? Oh, I, I was just wondering if my mic was on because that would have been an entire... <laughs> pointless thing ah anyway i i hope you guys are well i have uh yeah I, I this wasn't the planned introduction because anyway the guest on today's episode is a guy from in he's an indian for, who's moved to canada and i think he's moved back or he's in the process of moving back his name is mr sabi bg he handles uh he has a company now which does a lot of social media uh production he's got a successful youtube channel which uh you guys can check out the link is in the description it's called the sabi bg show he uh, i think he started off with some street interviews he went down the path of an indian in canada kind of going down that line of asking people and i think those videos where you do street interviews he's branched out to various other things and i talked to him about a lot of what's going on on youtube with the sort of the nature of the beast how the game has changed and oh i didn't even know that I, I, this wasn't why i brought up youtube earlier but anyway it kind of fits in um and how kind of what is the thing like what is his approach to kind of pivot as people call it like do you stick to what you're good at do you give the audience what they want do you give them what you want and kind of nurture the the, the sort of 
base of people who want to come for what you want to offer as opposed to just another person who gives them what's trending. So a bunch of things which I find interesting in this space, which also, you know, kind of educated me as to where I am in this and why um, these platforms have certain strengths which you can leverage or certain um, disadvantages which might not work for you. And just overall, it's kind of, uh, if you're someone who's a creator or someone who's in this space, you might benefit from some of the tips in this conversation where we go back and forth on uh, where he came from with this approach to uh, being a content creator, to where he has been, to where he's going, to what his uh, approach, his strategy, whatever the the, the, the the things he's done and he plans to do. And there's a bunch of things. He's a fun guy, a uh, lot of clarity and thought about what he wants. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll benefit from what he has to say, but you'll also have a fun time listening to our conversation. So as always, it would be much appreciated if you share it with someone you like or someone you don't like. Oh, depends. It's your call. It's your life. I'm not going to force you to do what you don't want to do. But it would be nice if you can head over to wherever you listen to your podcast, whether it's um, Spotify, whether it's on Apple, whether it's on GeoSavan, whether it's on Ghana. And I do apologize. But hey, by the way, if there was an ad before this, it's not in my control again. I apologize. Bunch of bastards keep bombarding us with this crap. I don't know, some shit like, oh, asshole whitening cream. Yeah, maybe I should just do it now. Asshole whitening cream so you don't look like the biggest douchebag. <laughs> Imagine that. It just looks like an eclipse, right? Like, yeah. Anyhow, um, yeah, if you could head over wherever you get your podcast, whether it's GeoSav and Ghana, uh, if they do have an opportunity for you to drop a comment or a review or a rating, rating with a T, uh, I would love it if you could give me a rating because more people can listen to this. Not not that it makes me feel like a five-star son of a gun, but more people can listen to it and more people can find out about how golf is like life and uh, more people can listen to a lovely guest like Mr. Sabi BG. So go ahead. Do drop a rating. Much appreciated. I know you've already dropped a five star. I know the possibilities are 10 star, but they've stopped it at five. But you can give it two double five stars, which makes it 10. I don't know. Do whatever you want. I'm not here. I'm not your dad. I'm not your mom. I'm not your therapist. I'm all of them rolled into one. So thank you. Uh, enjoy the episode. Goodbye. God bless. Till next time. Take care of yourselves. Cheers. Mr. Sappy BG, welcome to the Soapy Rao Show, and uh, how are you today, sir? I am doing good. What a pleasure to uh, meet you, Sandeep, and to be on your show. It's uh, really nice to speak to someone sitting right now in uh, which which part of Canada are you in? I'm in Toronto. Toronto. You know, it's you know, it's so strange that we always go back to Russell Peters the moment we heard of an Indian in Canada, <laughs> and oh. uh, mm -hmm. that journey begins there because you're, I think, the third or fourth person who's sort of oh. from India who's um, been to Canada, whether it's to study, and I think in your case it was for your masters. You you you, you told me, and I met a singer who went from Dubai to Canada. I met another girl who went there for a masters, and it it seems to be more of the thing now where it's, it's seeming like a more tempting option for whether it's um, a career opportunity or even academic opportunity. But when did you go? Uh, and f and can you tell my listeners? I mean, a little bit of your back backstory before you got to Canada. Like, what was the deal? Um, and what, what, what was sort of the reason you went there? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like a little concerned telling you exactly when I went because that's going to disclose my age to everybody. <laughs> and I still tell people I'm 22 years old. That's perfectly uh, but, fine. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I went to I went to Canada in 2008, nine ish mm -hmm. right after my graduation. And I was like, you know, uh, my, my aunt was living in Canada. My cousins were there as well. And they were like, hey, you should come here. Uh, I was very close to my cousins. So I was like, let's go. They came back after a few years, but then I ended up staying there for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, before I went to Canada, I traveled across India. My dad was in the Indian Army. So I was, you know, we were posted in the east of India, north of India, south of India, west of India. So I was very well traveled in India. Um, so it wasn't really difficult for me to sort of like uh, uh, move to a different location. Canada just for me was another location that I'm moving to. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I went there almost uh, 15 years ago and um, have been there since then. And your family is with you or you just went solo and just st <clears throat> went there to study and stayed on? No, so they, they still live in Delhi. Uh, uh -huh. they, they come meet me. My sister lives in the US as well. So they come meet with us. But I think uh, they're at a point where all of our uh, close family members are in India. So they do want to like, you know, reside in India and not really move there. 
Yeah, it makes sense. So how is it for you? Because, I mean, so what have you been doing? Because, I mean, a typical, you know, that is the Indian uh, dream of going to the West, whether it's, you know, especially for a master's program, going to the UK, now even Europe's an option, but otherwise it's North America, like especially the US or Canada, get your degree, get your master's, do a PhD and sort of get a job, then sort of then adapt to the American or the Canadian dream, move to suburbia, get married, move into a house kind of thing. So did you have that aspiration uh, to sort of go down that path or was it just let's wing it? Uh, no, I was actually pretty sure there was a movie in 2001 that came out and mm. uh, uh, it's so funny. I can't remember the name of the movie. Uh, American Pie came to my <laughs> mind just now. Yes. And that was the movie I remember watching. Was it 2001? Man, I, I thought it, it was, was one or two. It was around that same time. And when that movie mm -hmm. came out, I was like, if this is what America looks like, I want to be a part of America. Yeah. So yeah. I was pretty, I was pretty uh, uh, sure that I do want to, uh, you know, at least go outside for a few years and experience what the West has to offer. Uh -huh. uh, but I think just like any of my other friends, nobody really came back. I think once you go there, you just kind of like stay there. So I don't see a lot of... Uh, brain drain, you know, happening back from the West. But again, um, uh, till I was doing my bachelor's, I wasn't really sure. You mm -hmm. know, my, my aunt went there. Um, I kind of like started watching a lot of Hollywood movies. And I think that sort of uh, uh, prompted me to just feel like that I want to go out. Yeah, which is quite, I mean, it's quite a, I wouldn't say normal thing, but it's quite an attractive proposition, right? Going there and sort of immersing yourself in this new experience but being a child of someone from the armed forces um was there a sort of pressure to be um be in that follow in that in those footsteps and be in and serve the armed forces and was there any of that conversation growing up uh no luckily or uh, uh i don't luckily or sadly i don't know but my dad never really forced me to go into the mm. armed forces to a point where he was like you know there is not enough money in the army so why don't you if you want to do something outside of the army that's fine with me as well mm -hmm. he did make me give sort of like an nda exam and i failed really really bad and i think very quickly he figured out this guy's not going to be able to make it to the army anyway. So why don't mm -hmm. we just uh, look at something else that he can do? So no, really, I, there was no push. There was no push from my family on doing that. Mm, because that, that's that you mentioned NDA, right? I, for a second, I thought MBA. So NDA is the the entrance to the join. Okay, correct. Right, correct. right. No, and you know, it's it's quite it's quite cool to meet someone who's. Uh, of course, now I think it's important to divulge what you are actually doing now, and maybe take us back. Uh, to before uh, 2020, before the lockdown, where a lot of people were made to face the reality of what they're doing, why they're doing that, is it really w what they want to do, is what is their primary driving uh, force behind it, is it money, is it career, is it that dream, and all that was sort of, um, you know, kind of in the limelight when jobs were being sort of taken away people were forced to work from home i'm saying of course the time during the lockdown and the pandemic and so how was it for you and what what part of your life were you in in say beginning of 2020 sitting in toronto how was canada at that point because we heard a lot of you know, a lot of shit on the media where you know people in america constantly infighting masks no masks now it's vaccine anti-vax now of course it's ukraine <laughs> ukraine but right. and of course in canada comes in the news yeah, some horrific stories which are coming out now with things happening um, from the past resurfacing with the entire sort of the, the, the thing. But I don't want to go down that part of this conversation for another day. Uh, but of course, then you hear about the trucker strike, uh, people coming sure. and blockading the things. But a lot of the things I, I, I'd i like to talk directly from a person who lives there because I don't know. I don't want to say I don't trust the media. It's a conspiracy. But it's always nice to hear from a person who's on ground and who's experienced it and your perspective of experiencing that as a person who's from India, but of course lived there for many years and a person who's doing things in the art space and the entertainment space. And I mean, just your perspective on how it was, what happened and what are things like right now? No, absolutely. And I'll, I'll touch on exactly how it was for me in, uh, you know, when the pandemic happened. But I will tell you, I'm very pro-Canada. Uh -huh. And I don't, I, and I don't say this just because I'm biased by living there for that such a long time. Uh -huh. uh, I, you know, I, as soon as I finished my master's, I got a very good job. Really, uh, I've worked there for 15 years now, and not even one time I ever felt that I wasn't promoted or I was dealt unfair just because of my skin color. Right. Um, uh, so not only that, even when we talk about the pandemic. 
the way I think the government sort of uh, deals or takes care of the human life, I feel is much different from many, many other third world countries. Again, I think India did a great job in taking care of its nationals as well. But at the same time, uh, I had just lost my job when the pandemic happened, literally two months before the pandemic happened, as if my company knew it's coming. So mm. uh, as soon as the pandemic happened, we started receiving checks of $2,500 to $3,000 a month just to wow. survive. And that was just a good enough money to to a point where many Canadians never wanted to go back to job. We became yeah, why really would you? lazy. <laughs> um, exactly, yeah. exactly. It was, it was funny that exactly at the same time, when I lost my job, uh, and I guess we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I, uh, I'm i a full-time YouTuber uh, mm. now. But at that time, when I lost my job, I was like, you know what? I have the skill and I don't want to go back to a job. And I don't want to lose a job in future because yeah. of everything that a job brings to you. And I said, what can I do? How can I monetize my skill? And I saw a great opportunity in uh, helping brands and companies with video marketing in YouTube. And that's what I started doing. But I would say... I somewhere believe the government sort of supported me for the next year and a half by paying me those three thousand dollars a month while I was picking up my business. Uh, so it was actually yeah. a it was actually a very um, a supportive thing for me. But at the same time, um, I believe that uh, we as Canadians uh, or the Canadian government really dealt with the pandemic the best way they could have. Um, I am, again, very, very pro whatever was done in the first two years of the pandemic. I think that's so, um, I mean, just from your ability to, you know, say, you know what? I mean, you could have easily just said, you know, I'm going to sit on my ass and watch Netflix. But you decided to do this, build this YouTube channel, build this business of consulting, uh, helping people with uh, content or how to build a YouTube strategy. But I think just sort of, putting putting myself in your shoes going if if i was given as a, as a comedian uh if i was you know saying okay now i have to think of an other alternate business source or a source of revenue and now i don't have to dip into my savings but i'm getting a steady source of income of course it doesn't have to be the equal of three thousand dollars but whatever that can do for you in india the same amount because i think a lot of artists did struggle like i i was i was listening to a lot of the chatter about comedians in the UK uh, petitioning the government to give them some kind of stipend, to give them some kind of um, compensation because a lot of them are either street performers or they're performers in these, um, you know, um, in, in these night spots, which all shut down. So the fact that you had this backing or this, this kind of the safety net is amazing because it gives you that sense to take that risk and uh, especially in a space like YouTube, which can easily um, be overwhelmed by millions of other videos or channels being up and created and uploaded every day, right? So it's quite, it's quite fantastic. And you did you have a background which gave you sort of a bit of a an edge in the tech space? Were you a tech background? Were you um, someone who had a marketing background so you could leverage those uh, skills from your profession in this YouTube space? No, absolutely not, actually. You know, I, I tell people when a lot of my friends ask me or people that know me ask me, how did you make it into the business? And how did you make it to uh, creating a big channel on YouTube? And I always tell them mm -hmm. that I have never had a plan B. Mm -hmm. Anytime I've had a plan B in life for anything, I have seen myself not become very successful in those things. When I, when I, when I lost my job, and I was so sure that I'm not going to go back to a job, but at the same time, there was really no job because of the pandemic. What, what no job company. was that? Sorry, uh, with, with the one you lost before the pandemic. Are you so I was talk about so I, so I was an IT. So I was IT, a tech okay. guy. So I was a techie. I was a techie. Not that I think that helped me doing what I do now. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was a techie. I was working with some big companies like Hewlett Packard, IBM, OpenTax, right. some of the big. Canadian I mean, safe companies. job, good job, good money, good sort of positions, right? Yeah. So I would really call even that three thousand dollar was really supporting me uh, build my company. I was making almost fifteen thousand dollars a month going, and I had a mortgage, I had car payments, mm. I had insurance payments. So three thousand was like really the bare minimum I needed just to pay for my house. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and on top of that, I needed to make so I needed to get some clients every month just to survive. Yeah. Uh, but no, absolutely no marketing experience. I've uh, even when I started doing YouTube five or six years ago. Uh, I was like, this is, I tried singing. I, I used to play guitar when I was a kid and my friend said, Savvy, you're not really that great at it. Maybe give up on music. Yeah. I started singing and my friend said, maybe this is not what, this is not your cup of tea, do something else. 
So I started watching some YouTubers. Um, at that point, there was some popular YouTube uh, YouTubers in Canada called Just Rain, Superwoman. I started watching. Oh these right, guys are, are they Canadian? You're talking about yeah. Uh, that's uh, what's what's her name? Um, Lily Singh, right? Superwoman Lily Singh, absolutely. Ah, yeah, so she's li- actually from the same city. She's actually from Toronto as well. And Just uh, Rain is uh, the Sadarji guy, right? Yes, absolutely. He's right, completely right, no. vanished now. He's completely vanished. I don't know why, but I think uh, he's he reached the epitome of kind of like where he wanted to get to. And maybe I'm hoping he's doing some bigger and better things. And uh, mm. but I love these guys. And I'm like, wait a second, if these guys can do this, you know, I I can do this as well. Literally, I picked up a camera, started going out. And unlike these guys, I was not very skilled in comedy and all that stuff at that point. So I was like, what should I do? I would like to mention an Indian YouTuber. Actually, she's German, but she's of Indian origin. Her name is Anisha Dixit. Mm-hmm. Uh, she used to have a channel called Rickshaw Valley at that time. Yeah. And she used to travel to US and Canada and do funny street interviews. And I'm like, wait a second, this doesn't need any skill. Mm-hmm. I can do the same thing. So I started... Uh, doing a lot of videos. This was year 2017, mm-hmm. and I started doing a lot of street interviews, just talking to random people in Canada and Toronto, asking them about Bollywood, asking them about Indian food, asking mm-hmm. them about uh, uh, our language or accent, and kind of like give a funny, funny sort of uh, spin to it. And somehow, my first 10 videos didn't work, but my 11th video just worked and crossed a million views in less than a month. And I, that was my sort of like my gateway video, and that was my. Um, that's when I figured my calling is to become a YouTuber, and I never left, and and, and I never saw back. Um, there was yeah, no plan. Twenty seventeen, when a million views actually meant something, right? <laughs> now absolutely, well, a, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. a million views and uh, ten thousand subscribers actually meant something at that yeah. point. So I was, uh, I was the guy with ten thousand subscribers, and suddenly a very popular guy amongst all my friends. I think now I feel that we're sitting at three hundred and I don't know twenty seven thousand subscribers, and I constantly think about how to get to a million because anything yeah. less than a million doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's crazy. No, and 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 I want to ask you what it felt like because you're this guy. 2017 um i, I mean the, the conversation wasn't so polarizing back then i mean the, there was the, the seeds of it with this woke culture with the gender with the race all these things happening in the u.s and did you ever feel threatened going up and you said of course you already mentioned that canada you're really fond of the place the culture the people the government and you haven't you've never felt like your color has been a cause for people to sort of sideline you or to call you out but Doing this is um, a bit nerve-wracking, right? You have to put yourself out there, whether it's in a busy square or put yourself in a, on a busy street and someone's just busy going about their day and you're like, excuse me, I need to ask you something. What do you think about curry? Or And there's just, have you, what was some, what were some of the, I mean, of course, the highlights are out for everyone to watch on your channel, but were there any instances which were a little sort of hairy where people are like, can you get the, you know, get the F out of my, whatever you want to think. But was it, were, were there some instances which were uncomfortable? Uh, you know, there's so many moments that I've created by mm-hmm. doing what I did at that time. I've had uh, moments where I went and I'm going to talking to people and suddenly I had a camera guy that I just hired from a website called Craigslist. I turned around just to see the guy ran away with my whole camera. A <laughs> um, couple of months later, I had a, uh, I had a uh, gang of five people just coming and ri- literally they stole the mic off of my hand and they ran away. So we've always had those incidents. And so I you got always, mugged basically, right? Absolutely. A couple of times. And, you know, I always took that as a part of the game. I'm like, okay, this is what's going to happen. I kind of like put like some equipment in bad debt every year. But um, the first time I remember when I was doing my very first street interview and I went out, I was nervous as hell. And I was like, nobody's going to talk to me. Um, I talked to a couple of people and I was more nervous than them. And when you're nervous talking to a random stranger on the street, they can they will it, be yeah. nerve. They can sense it, and I could yeah. see that they're nervous as well because I'm nervous. And um, I think it was all practice. I tell you and my clients now because I tell people on doing videos and stuff, and some of these guys are very nervous facing the camera. And I tell them one thing: um, every professional was an amateur at some point. Nobody yeah. got to a million subscribers without doing their first video. So that belief. And the fact that I just put myself in the harm's way and I tried it one time and I tried it the second time and I tried it the third time, I learned a lot of things on the way I would approach people on the street and improve my chances of stopping them and talking to me. There was this one time uh, in the beginning when I used to stop people all the time, they used to think I am somebody that's stopping them to ask them for money. A brown dude in Canada, they're like, okay, this guy is definitely asking you for money or like a homeless guy. Mm. I started dressing up really well. I'm like, that's going to help. 
I started holding my phone in the hand so they know that I'm not a homeless person. Then mm-hmm. I also created these YouTube cards that had my YouTube channel name and that said subscribe. So when I would go walk to these people and stop them to talk to me, I would first show them the card before I ask them, hey, can I ask you a quick question? So they would right away say this is to do, this has something to do with YouTube. So right. I started doing things to make it easy for me to get people talking to me. And then came a point, I think, after my 30, 40 videos, literally... Um, I would have a little signboard next to my camera that would just say, this is a YouTube video. Would you like to talk to us? And sometimes I would see people lining up to actually talk to me. What I did notice, Sandeep, is that people are very open to talking to you. Random strangers wouldn't mind talking to you if you have the right vibe. Uh, is that also is they uh, sense a sign of them possibly getting a little big? Because, of course, you know, there is this hope that I get found one day, right? Do you think that's a little contributing factor to things? Uh, definitely that was a part of it i would have many people that would stop would say hey i'm a youtuber too or i'm an instagrammer as well and i do this as well and so certainly a lot of younger people would stop and they would interview with me uh and uh i would sometimes also see some funny goofy older people stopping as well who had uh no interest in growing their social media they were just people that just you know were traveling and i would normally conduct my interviews in a touristy zone at a touristy right, place right. in Toronto, so they were just having fun or they were maybe a little tipsy or whatever. So they were naturally more interested in just talking to me. So uh, I kind of like perfected the art. Actually, at this point, I can write a book on how to conduct street interviews. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's quite a skill because, you know, respect, man, uh, uh, because there is uh, nervousness, there's fear. There's also pub- fear for your safety, right? Someone coming and nicking your stuff. What's the next step in from them slapping you like uh, what's going on in the world today. <laughs> Slaps Absolutely. are freely being doled. Oh, yeah. But um, I think um, what, what what I also is, is interesting is because especially with um, Indian audiences, uh, what I've observed is because I've been a comedian now in 2022. I started out in 2009. At that point, YouTube wasn't a big thing in India. Of course, Russell sure. Peters had made sure. it big. But... I saw the wave of comedians who made it massive. There's a guy called Kanan Gill, I'm sure you've heard of, of course, who did a similar of thing called Street Interviews in Bangalore. That was they his sort of two ticket. guys. I think Kanan and there was another guy that used to yeah, his friend Nishant. To together, review movies and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Nishant and Kanan, that was the two friends who started out the street interviews, but then Biswa and Kanan did the pretentious movie reviews, true, which exploded. True. But Kanan was again a street interviewer to start with. But that was the initial wave and it's now just, of course, gone. It's crashed again. I mean, not crashed, but it's just sort of the building and building. And we have comedians like Zakir Khan and we have YouTubers sure. like, you know, Bhuvan Bam, um, who are just crazy big. And it's very hard for someone who speaks English to make it, uh, especially in this climate in India, because uh, it's, a, it's a very big regional language market. And for you to crack it as a an Indian who settled in Canada, with a lot of Indians there, because from what I've heard, there are there's a huge population, especially in Toronto. So was there ever a temptation to go and capture the Indian market internationally, especially start with Toronto, then move across Canada, then to the USA? Because I'm just giving you context, like there are a lot of comedians now, like like all the people I mentioned, who have a huge following of Indians, be it Indians who have gone there or Indians who were born there, who really like these guys. So it's almost that they have explored and sort of like how Russell Peters opened the market for Indian entertainers internationally. It's like these guys have opened the international Indian market internationally for Indians. Does that make any sense? No, absolutely it doesn't. I'll tell you, Sundeep, that my, I've always pivoted, right? I uh, As a creator, if I tell my friends and my clients one thing is that if you're not passionate about a topic, don't do it. You're not going to be yeah. successful at it. You may do it, but if you're not doing it with full passion and full heart, yeah. you're not going to be successful uh, in it. What I mean by that is when I started my channel, at that time, all I cared about was views. And I'm like, hey, mm-hmm. how do I get views? Talking to, uh, you know, uh, Americans and Canadians about India was getting me a lot of views because this was something new for Indian people in India to watch. Yeah. Then I pivoted a little bit to talking to a lot of Indian students in Canada. And that's why I get a lot of comments, even now on my videos, on people that are uh, students that are trying to come to Canada. When you type Indian students or study in Canada, literally all of my videos start showing up. So, so I is that almost that, uh, instructional in its nature? Like, oh, uh, as a student, like, oh, what, where can I go get 
Indian food or where can I, what, what should I carry when I come to Canada? What are the nature of... Kind of, kind yeah. of the same. The idea was still the similar, like where I'm still taking street interviews, but then I was talking, I was going outside colleges and universities and I would handpick Indian students coming out and get them to interview with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this actually helped, I think, uh, a lot of Indian students that are planning to come to Canada as well to know firsthand what other Indian students have mm-hmm. gone through or they should be doing. Uh, but then again, I got a little bored with that topic and I started doing, I converted my whole show to a show. My channel used to be called Savvy BG, Your Indian Abroad. Then I changed it to uh, to be called the Savvy BG Show because I wanted to look just like, I became a big fan of Jimmy Kimmel at that point. Mm-hmm. And I wanted my show to just look like sort of like a late night show and with the nice Toronto background and I'm interviewing celebrities and that's what I did. So that was my third pivoting for my show where I created a season. I created a show called Proudly Pardesi and mm-hmm. I was literally only speaking with, I would interview uh, popular NRIs um, mm-hmm. and interview them about their journey outside of India. Yeah. Uh, and then pandemic happened, got really, really difficult to get these people on my show. My latest interest uh, now that I, I, I've started seeing a lot of comedy skits and YouTube mm-hmm. shorts are becoming really popular where you don't have to create five minute long videos now. Yeah. People's attention spans have gotten really small. So I want to yeah. create really short 15, 20 second comedy skits. So in a few months, we've already started working on it. We have actors ready when I go back to uh, Toronto because right now I'm traveling kind of like the world a little bit. Mm-hmm. So when I go back in a, in a few weeks, we have a bunch of skits that we've already written. Uh, so we will start coming up with these short 15 to 20 second uh, comedy skits, which will still have an Indian and a foreign element to it. Mm-hmm. So that's my fourth pivot to my channel. So again, I'm always staying true to what I want yeah. uh, and also keeping in my mind what my audience may like and what's already being popular out there as well. Yeah, I know. I think that's the whole idea of people's attention span getting shorter and shorter. Uh, you know, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, TikTok clips. Uh, yeah, and, and that's why my podcast is an hour plus. And <laughs> it's clearly, I'm, <laughs> I'm just like, fuck it. I'm going to do what I like doing. And Absolutely. I really believe in that, man. You know, I think doing... I really like to find out about a person like, I mean, you, you, you have your YouTube success out there and I think that is for everyone to see. But I mean, I think there's something that drives you to that stage and continues to drive you. And I think that is what interests me because that's the thing that can take you beyond just views and YouTube fame. I think that's something which sticks with you. Uh, to life, right? The driving force, the motivating factor, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And I really, really like that. And, and ha- okay. How has YouTube, in your experience, changed? Has has there been, um, if you want to stick to YouTube specifically or maybe your experience with other platforms, because you do use um, your skills to help others, uh, has there been a shift with this entire sort of dispersion of, of, of information, with censorship, with maybe government crackdown, with all this um, sort of fire around Facebook and the way they're sort of using algorithms to explore, exploit uh, form, you know, formative um, and, and sort of mi- shape minds of younger people. So maybe have you experienced anything where things that were working are now not working for not from your reach, but because of certain instruments in place which prevent it? Oh, absolutely. I think the biggest one was losing 50,000 followers on TikTok in one day when uh, India banned TikTok. Suddenly, I lost all my followers. So, oh, but wow. again, okay. uh, but again, you know, I think that I think that you have to, as a content creator, you should be you should be very flexible. You should be like a water. You know, you should be like water. Any, you should be able to mold yourself in any shape. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is when I started doing YouTube. Uh, that was probably the biggest platform out there, video platform out there. Then TikTok came, now Instagram Reels is picking up. Then there's some Indian um, uh, uh, platforms as well, like Moj and Takatak and all these as well. So I hired people to actually cut short videos from my longer videos and Mm. post these videos there as well. I'm always, always, always looking at what can I do rather than what I cannot do. Yeah. Um, so, so, so I think, I think, as you said a few moments ago, um, if you are really doing something you're passionate about, um, uh, and you're a little smart where you can figure out how can you actually show the world your creativity in the best form possible, you'll figure your way out. So I haven't personally really dealt with a lot of issues, even with my clients now where, 
uh, any of these platforms or any of the Facebook um, restrictions and all this stuff sort of affected us. Mm. But I will be open to embracing anything that may affect me in future. Uh, but at the same time, um, I always tell people uh, as well that I, yes, I'm a, I, I, I connect myself with being a YouTuber because I have the biggest following there. But I'm, I'm always looking at how do I grow and expand my following, my reach on different platforms as well. I've now hired a bunch of people to help me with Instagram, with you know TikTok is again kind of like growing in Canada. Um, I'm also having a few people to help me with a podcast that I'm starting as well. So I'm being a little as an entrepreneur, I'm being a little smart in delegating work to other people, but then also growing you know me as a brand on other platforms too. Yeah, you know I think as someone who is you know, in the same space as you, but maybe uh, with a different medium. I think, or maybe someone listening right now who wants to pursue this, because I think maybe when I started out stand-up, even comedy as a, whether it's sketch or stand-up or improv or podcasting or um, YouTubing was unheard of in as as early, I mean, as recently as 2009, so it's 13, I mean, 13 to, a, yeah, 13 years back. But clearly now, if you ask kids, what do you want to be? They they even do consider YouTube or YouTuber as All kids a career. want to be YouTubers. You talk right, to kids, so, what do you want to be? They're like YouTubers. <laughs> right, it is. And it's fascinating that this, in, in, in a matter of a decade or 15 years, it's become so compelling that people actually think about it and go, you know what? I aspire to be that. And it, it's, quite, it's quite fantastic. But there is clearly a huge amount of content because when you give an individual and a billion or a billion or five billion people the power of a tool like YouTube and say, do what you want, there's gonna be a lot of great stuff, but along with that, there's gonna be a lot of shit, right? So what would you, what would, how would you, since you're an expert with helping people and companies, I mean, what would you tell him? This may be even a little more, the question may be a little uh, coming from a selfish motive. But how do you stand out, right, besides being um, consistent with what you want to do and what you want to put out and being also fluid and being flexible. Uh, what, what would be some tips you would give some youngsters today or yeah. future, few, people in the future watching this? Of course, things will and possibly change. But what are the things that do stick and some, some basic housekeeping things that they should follow? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this is a super important question because a lot of people give up on their content, crea content creation dream very early because they don't see results. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happens is, uh, what needs to be done is, first of all, you need to understand what you enjoy doing. Do not start something that you don't think you're going to like. But at the same time, we are in so much noise today. Yeah. If I want to do street, the reason I stopped doing street interviews or I start stop doing just regular street interviews is because how do I then stand out? To stand yeah. out, I actually started creating my street interviews in a way that it looks like a skit. And yeah. they became really popular. And now that one of the reasons I'm pivoting to doing comedy skits and not street interviews is because that's what the audience wants. And that's something I believe not everybody can do. Yeah. Um, really, everybody can go and do street interviews and ask people some questions and people are doing it. Nothing against those content creators, but yeah. as a smart You've grown content, from there. Yeah. I'm, yeah. As a smart content creator, I'm always looking at first, what do I enjoy doing still? Mm -hmm. And second, how do I stand out? Uh, you will have your own ways of standard, standing out. You may get bigger and bigger guests. I mean, already I've seen you some big guests of your, but not everybody's as fortunate as you to have the connections that you've probably had in the past where you're able to bring some big people, big names on your show. But many podcasters will start with just talking to their friends. And as their podcast grows, they just cannot keep inviting their friends. You need to you know, bring in people that have done something that have can that can provide some value. So you will have your own ways of standing out and making your podcast shine. Mm -hmm. Similarly, and branding can be a part of it. For example, the branding for your show is amazing. Like I see your graphics and all, it looks amazing. So for somebody so that's Mr. Somnath. <laughs> you know, so so yeah. kudos to so Mr. Somnath. But I'll tell you this that you should be as a smart content creator keep doing what you enjoy doing, but keep also looking at how do you Im uh, keep improving and yeah, yeah. Se separating your content from the rest. And that's what I'm doing as well. The reason I pivoted four times uh, on my YouTube channel is because every time I was like, okay, this has been, I've personally done it uh, now enough times. Now, what new can I offer to my audience and stand out? So standing out has been a constant, has been a constant um, um, uh, sort of like a need uh, you know, for me as a content creator as well. Yeah, you know, I think that's a very important point because, you know, I, I really, 
I think have considered these these points you mentioned when I was doing this because the first friends I used to date, I used to talk to myself. I mean, it was my podcast when it started out as the Baby Bed mm. podcast, which then changed to this last year. But what I noticed, I mean, just like your journey, I started out first podcasting in 2012 and I scrapped that after six months and again in 2014 and I was like not getting any results and that was the mistake I made back then because I was like, hey. But I think one thing which I... Um, ha- consciously have done with this podcast and i want to ask you two questions here one is do you feel like you know i, I want to get as i told you i want to get to know guests whether it's you know popular unpopular whatever the 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 status of their popularity is i want to get to know a guest and it's not just what you need dimensional it's not just okay this person uh is great at um crypto you know i i, I want to know all about them like what is the 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 the, the, the things that you know, they've done which didn't work, the things that they did which did do work, the things that they let go because they want to do something because it really drives them. So it, it's it's an entire complex set of things that makes a human being and I want to bring that onto the show. Um, but what I feel sometimes when this comes to guests is that the popular guests, and you said you do this with the Sabi BG show, is you get, you know, influential or popular NRIs. But do you feel in that space there's a after a point, there's a bit of repetition because the same popular guests, everyone wants them because they bring the views or they bring the followers. And what has your experience been with that? And okay, well, maybe we can address that and come back. I- I'll ask you the other question later. I think I forgot the question. <laughs> the second Lost one. your train of thought. <laughs> no, I, I, I wanted to know about this because it's something, it's a dilemma, right? Everyone's like, are you getting famous guests? And I'm like, you know what? It, that's not but the, again, I, yeah. I'll tell you this indeed. That again, when I started Proudly Pardesi as a show, that was a strategy as well. Right? Uh-huh. Yes, I do want to talk to popular celebrities, NRI celebrities, and 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 uh, offer my audience something new. But at the same time, uh, I at that point, one of my strategies was to build connections. I'm like, okay, I am this YouTuber with 300,000 subscribers, mm-hmm. getting millions of views. How do I actually give value? to a popular NRI so that I can build strong connections with them. So yeah. I started, you know, reaching out to people like Raja Kumari and I interviewed people like uh, uh, Jay Sean, who's a very popular British singer, was supposed yeah. to come on my show and then pandemic ha- happened and we just were never able to shoot that. But by giving value to these guys, maybe actually those videos of mine didn't get any views. Literally, my Proudly Pardesi series got Every video got less than 5,000 views, which was mm-hmm. absolutely non-traditional. Normally, my videos would which get is half for a million. Nothing for a channel with 3,000 plus, 300,000 plus subscribers. Yeah, yeah. So that tells me my audience was only interested in me going out and having Canadians taste uh, samosa. That's all they were interested in. They were not interested in me interviewing right. people. But the okay. idea of that was, uh, the strategy behind that was to build connections and give value to these popular NRIs. And actually, I was doing, I was very successful with doing that. So, so I'm mm. always very strategic with my content. Uh, doesn't mm. really matter if those guys go on different shows and speak as well. My goal was to offer them value and build strong connections, which I did. Mm. No, I mean, that's absolutely, I, I think that's that's essential. Uh, no, what I think the, the popular guest syndrome is, uh, you know, I think everyone wants the big guest. I think everyone wants the guest that Joe Rogan gets and everyone wants that kind of caliber of um, numbers when it comes to each episode. But, uh, you know, the thing you mentioned is this the, the show you did, Proudly Pardesi, where you had these popular people and it didn't do as well as you um, normally are used to seeing your videos do. Well, I mean, is there a thing like, is there a, is there a problem continuing? Because you had a reason for doing it, which is building these connections. But is there a point beyond which you need to stop doing that? Because is it like flogging a dead horse? Like, are you going to get nothing out of it? Because after, say, five, 200 videos and you're still bottoming out at 100 views, is there a problem with your content or is there some other problem? Um, again, it's being a content creator and posting different kinds of content and then getting data from back is like a wild, wild west. What I mean by that is sometimes you don't know what will work and what will not work. And that's why I tell people, let the data tell you what works for you. Yeah. The data told me that my audience didn't care about that. And you're right. I kind of like stopped doing that. I did a season one and a season two of that show. Yeah. And then I stopped doing it. 
I may want to do it again because I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed building yeah. connections just the way you do it. So I'm going to do See, I'm beyond the points from deep now where I'm only doing it for my audience. I'm doing it for myself as well. Uh-huh. Uh but at the same time as I said, if I just continue to do it for myself and I don't care about what my audience thinks, then my channel will suffer, which is also what I don't want. So uh-huh. I plan to be very strategic with my content and give my audience something that I feel that they would want in future, which is comedy skits and really funny street interviews while also in between doing content that I like to do but you're right in saying at some point if you're not really enjoying doing something and you're not seeing results i mean it's time to move on and pivot to something that you think is going to work yeah but is there is there a time in your youtube channel where say you've i mean you've maybe started a new channel and it's growing slowly and of course in this world of you're being snowed in under content it takes some time maybe some starting trouble some pick off some guests uh, get you that launch and again it goes back to a, a smaller uh, audience base but someone like you 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 really had a following for your street interviews a uh, the follow the, the the views dipped a bit for this particular talk show format but is there a po- possibility of that particular avenue getting you an entirely new fan base which the street interviews wouldn't have got you uh it actually did I actually did. I noticed okay. Okay. that my interviews with the uh, the the proudly Pradeshi season, I noticed that the comments and the engagement I was getting was a lot from the fellow and arise as compared to the Indian audience from India which would traditionally watch my street interview. Right. So you're completely right that it was a completely different audience and that's why I'm starting this as a podcast the proudly pardeshi show and the idea will be that those episodes where i talk to popular and arise will only be in the podcast format so the audio format so mm-hmm. again as i said i'm being very strategic with my content but then um you're absolutely right in saying that it would just bring me a completely new fan base of new audience as well so and 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 i'm very very analytical i look at my data i look mm-hmm. at where my audience is coming from for my street interviews 90% of my audience i would see inside youtube it's coming from india for my nri interviews a good 80% of my audience is coming from us canada and uk brilliant so how how do you deal with um this problem of quantity versus quality like in today's day and age where you can buy views you can you have bots and you have all sorts of various tools to enhance your numbers uh, what do you perceive as more important a quality audience or a large subscriber base and how is youtube treating that great question people ask me should we just post more or should we post less but quality the answer the the unfortunately the answer is you got to do both youtube <laughs> does not care about how busy you are youtube or any other platform as a matter of fact doesn't care about how uh challenge how many challenges you have in your life and you know if you have a family you what what they care about as a business these platforms care about first are you producing a lot of content and second are you producing content that's getting engagement yeah if yeah. any of these two things are missing at the end of the day the person that will suffer is you as a content creator yeah so again as i said i'm always 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 looking at how do i be more strategic with mm-hmm. my content what i mean by that is for me it was it's always been like okay what is it that's working right now So street interviews there was a golden era of street interviews that era is now gone not that it's gone i can still do it but i'm also not passionate about it cuz mm. i want to do something new then i did another thing which was interviewing popular and arise and i'm like okay this is fine but it's not working what do i do now i'm like okay comedy skits short comedy skits are really working and youtube shorts is a new platform golden opportunity for me to make really short videos and grow on youtube with youtube shorts and instagram reels and i can publish that on tiktok as well and all these other short platforms mm-hmm. so i'm going after that but i'm delegating a lot as well to improve the quantity of my show i'm not the one editing my videos i'm not the one uploading my uh, 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 content yeah. i'm not Tagging, the one distributing my content i'm not yeah. the one seoing i've built a whole little production team to help me with everything the only thing i am doing i'm actually even at, as a matter of fact I have put a job on LinkedIn just a week ago saying YouTube channel manager I need to hire somebody that can take the thinking away from me on how to grow the channel as well. So right. really I've been all about delegating and same thing I've done with my company as well when I started my business 
I was getting on these one-on-one calls with my with 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 CEOs and uh, marketing VPs of these companies, and I was doing the editing, and I was kind of like putting starting the YouTube channel. The only thing I do in my business now is sell. As soon as I sell, the whole work is done by a 40 people team, and I don't even get to see the work being done. Um, I just manage my 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 bank and kind of like the payments. So I think. As a smart content creator, being a content crea- creator is almost like being an entrepreneur. So as a, mm-hmm. as a content creator or a smart entrepreneur, look at how can you minimize your time in uh, creating content or doing your business while delegating as much as you can, which is what I've done as well, in order to solve the problem of quantity and quality. Yeah, because every day there's a new YouTuber who's going to be a star soon, born or someone in the near future will be a YouTube star. So the space is not getting cramped, but it is filling up. So how does one not get kind of flustered with, oh my God, I was the only player doing street interviews in Toronto. Now there are 30 others. So how, while, while not getting flustered, do you stay true to yourself at the same time, reinvent yourself while staying true to yourself? Is that something which you, which you think about consciously where like, okay, who's the real savvy BG and what does he want to do? But he, he also is aware of the fact that street interviews are something from the past and he'll continue to do it because his audience likes it, but he'll keep, keep them, he'll keep, stay loyal to them for that. But how do you think of new things to do while remaining the thing? Or do you just say, you know what, I'm just going to be all of it. I'm going to re- today I'm going to be a, a comedy skit guy. Tomorrow I'm going to be a musician. So what is your thought process behind them? See, I think first of all, you should have an idea of your audience, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not going to be always right. I thought my audience will like street interviews. The one that likes street interviews will also like me doing the interviews with the NRIs. Yeah. Uh, because I thought it will be a similar sort of theme, but I was not right. Yeah. Uh, right now, I'm thinking that my audience will like me doing some vlogging as well as some comedy skits. If yeah. not, I will create a new audience. So it's important that you understand your audience and you keep testing new things. But... There's nothing shallow in you thinking how to stand out. Uh, I, I get this idea from people when I say I'm done with this and I want to try something new because I'm not getting the kind of views I used to get. Yeah. There's nothing shallow. It's like you growing your business. It's like you being strategic with your business. Yeah. If your product was selling a lot in five years ago, now 10 other competitors have come in and they have lower prices than you and you're not seeing that much sale of your product, it's not a bad idea to you look at, okay, maybe I should, you know, venture into an, uh, another branch or another business as well. If right. I was selling, if I was selling only coffee mugs, maybe I can now sell um, coffee pots and maybe mm-hmm. that's an extra stream of income for me, which is less uh, congested as the, the coffee mugs market. There's nothing shallow in that. So I, as a content creator, even as a business, I'm always looking at what can I do in order to separate from the noise? And I think you are right in saying that uh, you said that it's not getting uh, cramped. Actually, it's getting cramped. Almost everybody now has a phone. These young kids are very camera friendly. They're, you see all these people making reels and short videos. So yeah. in order, but I'll tell you, less than 1% people are actually putting in the energy and effort to actually stand out. And in today's day and age, you will stand up. The chances of you standing out exponentially go up if you can actually do something that not everybody else is doing while understanding your audience and knowing what they want. So is the rules of YouTube, which were quite um, strictly followed of consistency and uh, quality, I mean, of course, quality differs from each person's ability, but is is consistency still important? Like a person who puts one video uh, once a month uh, versus one uh, every day versus one every week, are the rewards and the system um, in place, are they still sort of similar or is it just a person can put one crazy thing of a, a UFO spotting once in his lifetime and that's it, it's blown? I t- see, it's definitely getting harder and harder. Mm-hmm. But by saying that, I also want to add that in a way it's a blessing as well because as you see more and more people creating content, you're seeing more and more people creating just anything, like just absolute garbage. Uh, I would see these girls just having a camera and just showing their face for five seconds and getting 50,000 views. Uh, That's not a long-term talent. I mean, at some point, that beauty is going to fade and how do you plan to... uh, 
keep your audience engaged after five or ten years what i mean to say by that is that it's getting harder and harder to come in and grow as a content creator if you're creating just any kind of content yeah. but it will it's also it also means when you separate out quickly uh, there's a bigger audience now that wants content as well uh, yeah. to get entertained so it's getting easier as well to really look um, as that content creator that's putting the time and energy to create something special mm. um, so to answer your question that you specifically asked which is the the quantity and the quality i think obviously as i said earlier if you can combine quantity and quality that's the best if mm. you can produce a video a day while not compromising with the quality of the content then that's the best but if you cannot do that i think the focus should be on creating as much content as you can, not compromising the quality of the content. But again, yeah. as I said, the overarching theme should be that you should enjoy doing this, right? If you're yeah. doing a podcast, I think if your intent is just to get a million subscribers and that's why you're doing it, there's no point doing it. I mean, do it because you enjoy doing it and keep thinking about how do you actually do a podcast that separates yourself from all the other podcasters out there or yeah. YouTubers out there. And that's what I'm thinking as well. Um, yeah. The way I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of creating more content is by creating a team, even hiring a person that can think about these short videos, uh, having a videographer come in and for me just to come in and act and go and somebody else to be editing, somebody else to be posting and adding. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I am going to be dealing with the quality and the quantity issue. But my goal is to get both of them going on so I can grow really, really fast. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. You know, I think that's a really impressive way of looking at it. And I think one of the mistakes that entertainers or YouTubers, I'm not speaking on behalf of everyone, of course, but this happens even as comedians is you look at your audience as a static group of people. Like you look at them as, oh, they like, uh, these are the kind of audience who likes my material or this is my audience broken down into data, right? And they become analytics. But I think there's something which I've uh, come to appreciate is that audience are as fluid and dynamic and volatile and changing as the creators. So what they might like today, they might aspire to like something else, like a person from a small town might move to a bigger town or vice versa. And they might either become more sustainable, they might become more uh, fast paced, they might have more spending power. They might say, I wanna go from watching a Bollywood movie to watching a Hollywood blockbuster or whatever it may be. I'm saying the change is what makes us human beings. Um, so the thing is, while you are at, you know, playing the strategy game, I think what I what I think I, I mean, this is from a personal point of view, is that every day there are new people being born and new people being exposed to more information and new people realizing that, you know what, okay, I might be from a small town in India and I might be expected to like Salman Khan movies or I might be expected to like Bengali films, but there is a day when that person might say, you know what, I've done it all, but I realized I really like re reading like a P.G. Woodhouse novel. So I'm saying it could go full circle and come back. So I find that fascinating and something which I don't think we can account for, right? Uh, absolutely. No, I completely agree with you. 100%. 100%. Because it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite an amazing thing. But h how do you deal with... Uh, with trolls <laughs> i have to ask you that <laughs> oh i love i love trolls man i love trolls there was a point i didn't but right the more haters you have the more trolls you have tells me that you have people jealous of you doing what they can do mm. uh the only trolls i get a little concerned about are people that could mean some kind of harm like physical harm there was a time i remember i made a video when i don't know if you remember there was a whole pewdiepie versus t-series thing going on Mm -hmm. uh, this was a couple of years ago where PewDiePie, who's the biggest YouTuber or was the biggest YouTuber at that point, mm -hmm. was around 80 million subscribers. T-Series as a YouTube channel was picking up and uh, Mr. Beast, who's now one of the biggest YouTubers, was promoting uh, PewDiePie to everybody in U.S. to subscribe to PewDiePie. Actually, he was paying a lot of money on, in billboards in New York and California saying subscribe to PewDiePie because we need him to get to 100 million subscribers faster. I made a video where I went on the streets and I talked to people and I kind of like did a little, made them enact a little skit where I told them uh, and told, you know, white people, I'm like, listen, you're T-Series, you're, imagine you're the T-Series channel, yeah. tell people that subscribe to T-Series and I had no interest in growing the, helping T-Series grow, it was just sort of like a funny skit and when I posted that, that video, within four hours, I remember it was 1 a.m. I posted, the video blew up, within an hour that video had 200,000 views. 
yeah. uh, which was a little abnormal for even my videos on my channel. And I had um, out of those uh, 200,000 views, I had around 90,000 dislikes and maybe 500 likes. I could clearly see the whole PewDiePie army was disliking the video and that's why it was growing so fast because YouTube Ooh. still takes a dislike as a as an engagement and YouTube was like there's something viral going on with this video and it was promoting one guy sent me a text on my phone saying I'm from the PewDiePie army this is your address we will come and hurt you if you don't remove that video now that was a little too much for me and I'm like how does this guy knows my address yeah because uh, obviously that is not something that I put on my YouTube channel or anywhere. And that's when I took off the video for, you know, a couple of days. Uh, but other than that, I love trolls, man. Trolls are uh, so much fun. Trolls are, um, sometimes I laugh at some negativity. But again, you know, I'll tell you this. Um, as a content creator, I get, and I'm guessing you probably, you know, uh, experience the same thing as well. We get so much positivity from our audience that it really doesn't matter if we get one or two people sort of like disliking or saying something negative about the content. I'm just beyond that stage where I even give a shit about somebody saying anything about my content, unless mm -hmm. it's constructive criticism. Fair enough. I think that makes sense. Constructive stuff is always helpful because there, are, there is someone out there who knows more than you, I think, who might not have the time to create a channel, but I think that's a very valid point. And well, I think, sure. you know, a couple of things I want to just sort of talk about before we, we, we call it a day is, with this whole thing of um, taking out the middleman, I think you mentioned T-Series and all these big labels, uh, like, you know, in the music spaces, Universal and Sony, etc., who now artists in the music space are really struggling with, because even with Spotify streaming or whatever it may be. And now we, uh, to rival that, you have the YouTube revenue, you have YouTube subscription models, and you have Patreon. Uh, what is what is the thing? And, and you, since you have a large Indian following, uh, Indian audiences, what is their tendency to spend on someone they like? Is is that something which is uh, growing as a culture or do we still really love the free stuff? Uh, I think it's very low, at least from my experience. I cannot really talk for everybody. Yeah. I think if you're providing value, um, you would still have people paying you for super likes and uh, other things that YouTube has uh, in helping you create revenue, but me living in Canada, I cannot rely in people giving me 50 rupees or 100 rupees on my live streams. So mm -hmm. for me, it didn't work out. But then I watched some Indian channels that are really popular, like podcasts and um, other things. Uh, where I see when these guys are doing live streaming, people are really giving them 50 rupees, 100 rupees, 150 rupees, 200, whatever, which may help somebody sort of have an extra income. But yeah. I would still believe that somewhere like as a as a as a as a culture, we do not really value value as much as maybe Westerners do. Uh, yeah. I have some friends. I have some big friends. I have some friends that are big. Not I should say big, like 30, 40,000 subscribers YouTube channel. So not like a million subscriber channel. But one of them is almost making $50,000 a month in just Patreon. He's got a small channel, very niche. He's helping men uh, just get better. And the the men uh, that are part of his tribe, part of his community, like so much of what he does. Yeah. Every time he goes live, I can see people throwing $50, $100. Every time he finishes a live stream, he's ended up making five or $10,000. So mm. I think as a culture, like maybe we are not as open to giving sort of monetary value to our content creators as compared to the West. But I think we're definitely getting there. We're getting to a point where I, when I go to Indian live streams, I see actually people paying the content creators as well. That's encouraging to hear. I think that's uh, really neat. Uh, something that needs to be done if you want to empower independent creators and not just put the money back into the main system that sort of takes it all and exploits the artist. So, I mean, I'm so glad that we could speak, uh, Sabi. I think what you're doing is fantastic. I think you really sort of have aspirations. And uh, I, I'm sure it's interesting. I mean, I hope, uh, you're, I'm, I'm sure your family really sort of admires, I think, what you've done for yourself. And uh, how has their reaction been to all your YouTube success and the YouTube plans? um i'll be honest man first i don't care like what people think because i yeah. want to do me i want to do what i enjoy doing yeah uh, my my family fortunately have been very supportive what i mean by that is they've never ever said to me once don't do this 
or yeah. why are you doing YouTube videos or why, you know, uh, why are you, when you quit your job, why did you start your business? So I've been very, very fortunate to have a very supporting mom and dad. Mm. But I think that many people, um, even the people that are helping me in my team, some of these guys are content creators, but they're not at a point where they've been able to monetize their content. So they're working with me yeah. uh, part time as freelancers, full time, whatever that may be. And I hear stories that these guys tell me where they're their parents don't even know what they do as a as a part-time gig as a side mm-hmm. gig they mm-hmm. can't even tell their parents that they're helping a youtuber with editing That's and uh because they're like editing what do you mean by editing we you know we paid thousands of rupees to help you go to uh, engineering school and what you're doing now is editing but this is what they enjoy doing this is what they love yeah. so i i see that i see that as a trouble i think in a society like ours which uh we're in we're so competitive uh, you know, and everybody wants their kids to do really well, where kids don't have the freedom to really um, uh, tell their parents and family or even when I tell somebody in India that I'm a YouTuber, now I think we're getting more and more open. But I remember like five or six years ago when I tell somebody that I'm a YouTuber, people would sort of like frown upon me saying, oh, I mean, this is OK. So that means you're not good for anything else. That's why you started making videos. Yeah. Uh, but honestly speaking, I never, ever cared about what anybody okay. thinks. And I think that's the reason why I have been able to continue to do what I enjoy doing. Well, cheers, brother. I think that's, I think, a fantastic attitude to have, especially in in this space where you need to be a little tougher than um, what people, you know, make it out to be. You have to be a little thick skinned. You have to kind of do it because you want to. So, you know, cheers to that. And I think congratulations on what you've created for yourself and what you've created for people to, uh, to view and to, consume and to um, want more of. So um, I think all the best for your the future sort of plans you have for your company, for your entire team. And uh, I really appreciate you getting on the Soapy Rao show and uh, joining me today. And if you could tell my pe- people listening where they could find your channel, the name, and if any other things you'd like to sort of um, direct them towards, that would be great. Yeah, no, sure, man. This was an amazing conversation. I, I hope I'm able to help some of your viewers that also want to be content creators on the mindset and attitude that they need to have. Mm. Uh, uh, But amazing conversation. Thank you for your time and having me on your show. And it's very simple to find me. You go on any of the social media, Instagram, YouTube, whatever type, the Savvy BG show, and you'll find me there and make sure you follow me and subscribe, like, share and subscribe to my channel. Lovely. That's S-A-W-B-Y-B-G. I'll put the link. I'll put the details in the description, of course. And, um, We will stay in touch and all the best, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much.